Hi, everybody. It is Thursday, and we are Trekkers Delight. I am Marie Brownhill. I'm here with Jermaine, Jason, and Keith, and we are going to be discussing Lost in Translation. No, not the movie. Not the, the Strange movie. New Worlds episode. Um, Uhura gets to shine. We get another surprise guest star, and we all have feelings and thoughts on it. And beautiful bean footage. All right, so this week we have a meditation on grief and what it means, as well as on what communication is. So before we get into that, who wants to fall on this week's sword? Well, oh, I have yeah, I have something ready for us. Because you're just that awesome. <laughs> the Enterprise has been dispatched to a nebula to mine for deuterium along with the Farragut, and Pike has fleet command of both the refinery and the Farragut. Meanwhile, Uhura has been lacking sleep and hearing noises no one else can hear. She decides to run a full diagnostic and relies upon the former chief engineer, Hemmer, for help. We learn things have been slowed down in receiving the deuterium. After leaving the nacelle, Uhura sees a zombie image of Hemmer. Uhura reports to sickbay and learns she was hallucinating due to exposure of the deuterium and Binga orders her to get some sleep. Commander Riley is in charge of getting the refinery back in line and is assisted by Palia. Palia believes there is an underlying cause. Ahura is still having trouble sleeping. James T. Kirk comes aboard the Enterprise for the first time and is taken on a tour by his more handsome older brother, Sam. Palia returns from a fuel injunction port and notifies Commander Riley there is evidence of sabotage. Ahura turns to Spock for help, but he assures her it was her proximity to the deuterium and lack of sleep that is causing her hallucinations. Ahura runs into James Kirk at the bar. Once she leaves the observation deck, she experiences another hallucination where she is violently forced to fight herself, but in reality has hit Commander Kirk. Agreeing not to write her up, Ahura takes him to her quarters to fix his bloody nose. Kirk decides he believes Ahura and agrees to help by checking with the Farragut's doctor. Riley and Palia lead a team to investigate and find a lieutenant is the saboteur. They quickly realize something is wrong with him medically. Uhura finds herself in, an, in another hallucination where several members of the bridge crew die. Commander Kirk returns from the Farragut with the news that the saboteur had previously experienced hallucinations on the Farragut. Mbinga reports that Lieutenant Ramos's language center of his brain is compromised and getting worse. Ramos attacks the doctor and escapes from sickbay. Ramos kills an officer while attempting to cut the power. Ahura has another hallucination and feels everything is closing in until Kirk touches her. She goes back to sickbay. On her way back, she finds Ramos in a port nacelle. She tries to convince him that his hallucinations are not real, but he still tries to blow up the nacelle, so she tries to stop him. Kirk shows up and transports them away before the explosion. While reviewing Ramos' personal logs, Uhura realizes they were having the same kind of hallucinations. She recounts a memory she has where she tried to recreate the death of her parents and brother. Hemmer's death brought back all of those memories. Kirk tells her she must face death by holding on to their memories. That motivation gives her an idea. She realizes she has elevated activity in the language area of her brain. She realizes someone was trying to communicate with her. Sam says extra dimensional life forms can poke into our dimension and attach themselves onto atoms in our dimension, which allows them to communicate. She finally realizes Starfleet is killing the new life forms and they need to be set free. Her contacts Pike and tells 
them the station must be shut down. While in the turbo lift, her receives another hallucination about her family's death. Pike orders the evacuation of the refinery. Her screams to fire torpedoes. Pike concurs with a nod from Emma. Her knows it worked. We learn Spock and Nurse Chapel will not inform Starfleet of their fraternization. Paleo was Riley's professor at the academy, and Riley deserved the C she received. But, but Paleo knows what has been bothering Riley was really the death of Hemmer, and her presence is only a reminder. Sam decides he's going to write a paper about the life forms living in the deuterium. Sam tells Jim he is proud of him, but Jim can't seem to respond in kind. Jim and Spock meet for the first time and are introduced by a her. Wow, so would you have been mad if somebody else did the recap? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm not gonna lie, that was gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> that was absolutely gorgeous. I am amazed. Um that's yeah, what I can do when I'm like, not at work. <laughs> starting nice. next week. Mm. <laughs> right. Starting next week is we're going back to our uh, haphazard summary. So, yeah. <laughs> be looking forward to that. Oh, it'll, it'll be a good episode to go back to that because it's the, uh, the crossover. Oh, man. <gasps> well, I don't, oh. know what the, I don't know what the next week is. So, I actually kind of don't want to. It, it's the Lower Decks crossover. We're, we're going to see purple hair. Oh. Those old scientists, the name of the episode, and they already released the clip of Boimler waking up in sick bay and freaking out as Boimler would. That's awesome. Oh, speaking of which, who who would who was the guest appearance that you were talking about? So we had a guest Kirk. appearance. Oh, I kind of at this point don't feel like he's a guest appearance. I mean, <laughs> oh, like I've been seeing him. I, there's a whole a, there's a whole conversation we, about we that. You could argue go. that he's had way more lines this season than Pike has. Also, can we t have a brief moment to talk about the fact that the actor in question is actually far older than the Kirk is? And like, I am no mm -hmm. longer, I am no longer believing in a young, vibrant Kirk here. He's like 30. Yeah. He's, he's in his 30s, definitely. Um, so, I don't know. And, and I finally placed where I found him, where I'd seen him before, which I briefly watched the Vampire Diaries before Love I was like, it. nope. Loved it. Uh, come on, Marie. We know you are a devotee. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> mostly because I lost. Mostly because I lost cable. Um, uh, man, we are so out of that era now. The vampire. I know, era. Right? I well, know I mean, man. We for like twenty years it was. It was um, the do. other thing I want to bring up before we get into like the real meat of the episode is, y'all, like the Ramon death like visuals were unnecessary. Hmm. Like, why did we need to see him turn into an icicle and then do a 360? Yeah. Like, what was that? Like, I'm, I'm, jiving, I'm vibing with the episode and vibing with the episode and vibing with the episode. And then, you know, he gets blown out. I'm like, oh, okay, we're going to move on. No, no, no. We have to have a loving CGI recreation of his death. I'm like, oh, that was unnecessary. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jermaine. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a thing that I always talk about how they always just, like, <laughs> they freeze, they go out in space and just freeze so fast. It's like you see, oh. look, look at it. Right, look, at we the, can click off of that now. Thanks. Look at the frozen condensation in front of his face. Yeah, I mean, I it's, it's that I guess, cold in space. I guess that would be the only moisture that would be coming out of his mouth. But I doubt you're. Yeah, no, like I mean, he is mostly water, and water would freeze in space. So yeah, like that I'll tracks. Bag of mostly water. Mm. That drags. So, but yeah, I was just like, why? Why? This is so weird. Um, yeah, and we were we were fine with just seeing him getting blasted out of the nacelle, and mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like, I'm, I feel like somebody needed extra time in the episode. <laughs> it was a short episode, and it, it, it was so much that they no, put it, in there. Right? It seemed like it was slow. Like they were just like, yeah, it, like started the pace a little earlier. The pacing was really weird. Um, I really, I like the episode actually um, because I, I really like what thematically it dips into. I'm serious when I say it's a meditation on grief and how that impacts us and how we deal with it. Um, because that's, you know, we find out that Ramon was grieving a friend and that, you know, Uhura has been grieving her family and Hemmer. 
Um, did uh, did Hammer's actor come back? By the way, yes. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Is that's awesome. Back? Now that's the real special guest star of this episode. Is yeah. Right, coming back. Hammer. That's valid. Um, it was great to see him again. Yeah. Uh, well, one other extra bit of subtext on grief: the name of the nebula is Bannon's Nebula, named for the uh, significant other of Melissa Navia, who passed mm -hmm. away last summer. So this was the them honoring him and uh, you know sharing their grief with Melissa. Because she passed away before she went into um, filming season two. She's written a beautiful essay on what that was like. So it's the layers of grief and everything that in this episode is I feel like Star Trek has had a lot of these episodes. I don't want to say a lot, a handful of these episodes of um, some other beings trying to communicate and it causing a muck amongst the crew. Um, like like right. Night Terrors, TNG. Mm -hmm. um, season four of Discovery. Season yes. four of Discovery. Um, yeah, the whole season pretty much. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to say, uh, I, I mean, we had a little bit of this. Um, Charon of Discovery, a ball of Charon or something. Yeah. A ball of Charon, yeah. yeah. And we also had a little bit of it in Enterprise, too. There's an episode where Hoshi gets contacted by the telepathic alien and nobody believes her. And there were a lot of moments here that brought that back to me. I was trying to think of an Enterprise one, and I guess that would be one. They figured out pretty quick what that was, though, right? That was no. It she, takes an entire down. episode, right? That's not like, when she went down to live with the thing with the guy. Yeah, he wanted her to live with him. Yeah, and she said no. But right. yeah, like, and what, what's interesting and what's very very different about this is that um, nobody believed Hoshi. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. all thought she was nuts. And while everybody is is pretty convinced that Uhura's nuts, they're still willing to go along with it. They're willing to have that conversation with her in a way that we didn't see with the female characters in enterprise mm -hmm. which i think well is, usually is um star trek somebody says i saw saw something they're like oh you're just tired well which to like, be fair oh, to, be, to fair, be fair they run, yeah. they run the crazy shit on a regular basis so they should be they should have their like crazy shit antennas on like oh is this some crazy shit about to happen let's dig deep well as, as janeway said in voyager that's just part of the job Right, but Voyager itself had a few episodes like this because you had the the one with the Void aliens that yep. they and also Species Eight Four Seven Two contacting Kess, and then that one episode where uh, Seven of Nine was the only one awake and everyone else was asleep, and her hearing things and imagining. Things. But she was just kind of going a little nuts, right? I think it's called. Was it called One? The episode mm. she was just alone. I her and the doctor, right? Or did the doctor have to go to sleep too? No, I mean, I, are we talking about a night in sick bay? No, no, that's Enterprise. No, that's they spent like no, 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 no. Yeah, they had to is. spend like months. She spent like months by herself while the crew was asleep. I mean, Data had one of those. Data did. Um, They're always trying to contact through Data, and then there was another one where it was like the I don't know stuff. Kept, different systems kept going haywire on TNG. And it was like some entity going through different parts of the ship to try to find a way to communicate. Don't remember what that was, though. Well, there was uh, the next phase, the episode where Jordy and Roe died, and they were they uh, were trying to go through the ship, getting everyone's attention because they were still alive, just in the layer of subspace. Right. They, they, they kept just leaving behind... Part, uh, residual particles of Tetrion, something, whatever data kept yeah. saying. And well, Enterprise did that as well, too. With the... So, quick yeah, question anyway, about this, this particular episode. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of this, is going to be real quick. In terms of Spock and Chapel, um, <laughs> yeah. are we betting people? Are they going to stay together for the remainder of this season, or will it end by episode nine? I think they'll probably end it because if they if they don't want to tell people, they can't really do anything because people are going to notice anyway. Can we have a conversation about that whole like Schrodinger's relationship nonsense? Because I'm sitting yeah. there like, what the hell? Well, well, I they, agree. They did... I agree with Chapel that they don't need to start talking to, to 
to Starfleet just yet. Yeah, there doesn't need to be paperwork involved in this. Right, but also, like, I mean, are we just not going to tell everybody? Because I sort of feel like everybody's going to know. I mean, because that was a very intense Tridy chess game. I like how, in my head, I was thinking, that's not exactly how it works. And then, and then Spock said, that's not how it works. <laughs> when he was talking about the superposition of the other cat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the super superposition of the quantum something or other. I was like, that's a lot of words that make sense. Mm-hmm, sure. <laughs> basically, basically, she basically polarized it as being something that may be or something that may not be. Quick question for you. Do you think that in the upcoming Academy series, do you think that we're going to see Palian? I would hope so. But yeah. I think it's going to be set in the... Well, it, she could be if she's still living in the 32nd century. Because this is going to be a direct spinoff of Discovery. So are, there any lower deck, are there any lower deck people on Discovery that you would want to see? Technically tall, grayer lower deck people. Well, no, it, it's, it's Tilly. Right now, it looks like it's going to be Tilly's show. Right. She's going to be like a teacher. Right. She's not I am so excited teacher. about that. I really want to see like what, what shit show occurs. <laughs> <laughs> like, because it's gonna be a shit show. All right. Yeah. Like it's not gonna be good as good as lower decks. No, no, no. I no, think it's gonna be fantastic. But I, with, with her with her. Yeah, like character. I think that, yeah, no, I, I think it's gonna be like an absolute shit show, like watching Tilly try to navigate students. Because I mean I back me up here, Jermaine, but teaching is hard. I think by the time you get to that level, it's a lot easier because you're not dealing with hormones and well, you're dealing with some of it. But <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't be extreme. dealing with. It's like when you go to college, you don't see as many disrespectful people in the classroom as you do in high school, elementary school. I not teach you, graduate really. students, and I can tell you, I've had some really, really? disrespectful, drama-filled individuals. Because I didn't mess around any really any of my classrooms in college, like. Yeah, I, that might be like an age thing, Jason, because what students do today, we definitely didn't do. When we were well, I, I'm, I'm in elementary school and high school, I, I messed about. But like in, in college, I was like, this is a whole different game. I doubt what you can say. Look, if you live today, number one, you would be in shock. Number two, the things that you did, they wouldn't even respond to. I am living today. <laughs> is this I, is this is this under your you, you, you starting shit? Like, is that what that is? You said if I live today, <laughs> as a kid. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I you know, I I, I made jokes and stuff in class. I wasn't a delinquent, you know. I wasn't about to start fights with the teacher and shit like that in class, no. or other students. Well, <clears throat> we have that, right? <laughs> I have people do that in my school. This is trouble because one of our teachers was a former WWF wrestler. Well, why tell him to watch himself because he's gonna throw him in jail real quick as soon as he touch one of them kids. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, that, got re- that got weird real fast. All right, I feel so sorry back for to the, the episode. Sometimes because yes. they, they defend themselves with these kids and then they're in trouble for defending themselves. Yeah. By the way, up. by the way, Jason, you are right. The name of the episode was one. Was it one? Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> High level. So, your your thoughts about the episode. Let's start with Keith first. Well, I found it interesting how many connections between this episode and Star Trek 2009. Like you had the introduction of Kirk and Ahura in a bar. You had Spock meeting Kirk by way of a her there, and you you know it ends the episode with the three of them together, and them of course being the th- basically the 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 Kelvin trilogy. We, they are the three main characters, mm-hmm. and just other things that I felt called back to that movie. Uh, what was there? Which is called- interesting because like it was very definitely a call. Like the last episode was a huge callback. Yeah. Well, remember that Ahura was originally assigned to the Farragut when mm-hmm. they were being sent out, but got you know switched to the Enterprise at the last minute. 
uh, trying to think. There, there are other couple little things that now I'm blanking on what they were. But yeah, th there were several things that I thought were <coughs> callbacks to it. It's surprising. All right, Jason, your thoughts on what Keith is saying? No, about the episode. <coughs> Um, I liked it, but like I said before, I thought it was a little slow pacing at the beginning, like getting to the point of what the show is about. But I do understand they were, they are trying to do more character development than uh, just presenting you with razzle dazzle sci fi stuff that's happening. So I think that's sort of a good thing. We did want to wrap up sort of like what's going on with, uh, I mean, because after what happened with Spock and Chapel, you couldn't just leave that without any follow-up whatsoever or you could i guess that's how you keep people you know invested mm -hmm. um i did i did like the episode i liked that it was a horror based um yeah it's good marie i'm gonna make mine really short and then you can go um the only thing about this particular episode that left me saying like man they missed an opportunity um laan and kirk there was an opportunity for the two of them there to develop something. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen to Laon's character, right? And because we don't, we don't know what that could have done meant for James Kirk, right? And so I just, I, to but me, to her, opportunity. To her, she's reminding herself that that's not him. But it could be. But if she if she tried, she walked away, even though he asked for. Um, that drink, she just walked away. But is right. it, in in a way, is that like your dog dying and getting another dog that looks exactly like it? Sort of it's, like replacing. It's like, the same person. But it's not. It's, it's not. But it's, but it's the same person. She knew who he was, just like he knew who she was. He was like. Well, I mean, he like knew James. who she was because uh, she called him. That, right. A great place to start. You know, I think Laon is just deeply awkward. Um, and I think she's still kind of grieving the Kirk that she knew and, you know, had a bit of a relationship with, right? Like, whirlwind though it was. Um, I think it's really hard to just kind of make that make that transition. Because on the one hand he has the same face as the person she cared about, but on the other, he had vastly different experiences uh -huh. and that made him a little bit of a different person, I think. Um, and I think it might be difficult for her, especially if she's still processing because I mean, God knows she's not allowed to talk to anybody about it. So yeah, I would be processing yeah. like what happened. I think it would be very difficult to just jump into that drink. But what does that do for character and storyline? So Kirk meets Khan and has already had interaction with one of his descendants. I think that's also part of it. Right. I mean, we haven't seen that. I mean, you think it's like it's cool when they do stuff like that, but then you think about it, it's like, well, if this really happened, then and uh, what is it, Earth Seed, he would have been like, oh, I knew your descendant. Or Spacey. called her out, so that means she's there. Or he would have called her up, like, "Hey, your great granddaddy's here over here." No, I mean running, running amok. Well, what we've gotten from her about Khan, I imagine that you know she would not want she would not want that call. In fact, that's the least things that she would want is for him to suddenly come back into her life, or well, come into her life or anyone's life. Marie. Your thoughts about the episode? I, I, just, I, I you know, I, I, I stand by my comment that I think this is a really sort of complicated, messy situation for Laon, and I don't think Laon has the emotional resources yet to do that. Um, we've seen a lot of growth out of her, especially in um, the courtroom episode, whose title is escaping me at the moment. But um, Sarah Ad Astra. Yeah, you'd think I'd remember, but no. Um, we're starting to see some of that and, and some of those cracks in those walls, but it's, it's a process. And I think it's a process for her. Um, 
and I suspect we'll see some of this come up again to, to Jason's point about what is this going to do for character development? Well, hopefully it will be another reason for Laan to open up and to try new things and go in different directions and possibly grow in a different direction. I find myself like judging this uh, series on my own set of criteria that I desired for myself for it. We are I all keep, shocked to hear that. I keep saying to myself, does this fit the title Strange New Worlds? Like every every time, because I always feel like I want to see more like worlds. And I'm like, well, you know, they did get you know, contacting a new species. It's contacting them. So that's a strange new world. And yeah, it, but apparently we can't find a dimensional species, by the way. <laughs> like that's right. just not a thing we can do this season. I would love for Jordy them. would have found them in a second. <laughs> <laughs> I would love for them to make contact with the Ferengi. Yeah. They said well, we know that first contact with Ferengi was TNG. Was that, was first, it oh, first that, that was first yeah, contact was when first they saw time. them on that planet and they were Yeah, all, remember the laser whips? The most primitive messed up Ferengi you ever seen. The last outpost from season yes, one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. One of those yeah, we but, don't talk about. Well then the trill. The laser whips. No, I, I want the beta zoids because they could have used the beta zoids this episode. Right. Oh, Even yeah. Troy, they could have used She'd have been there like one moon circles. <laughs> <laughs> one moon circles. What, whatever the whatever the molecular makeup of deuterium is, that's what she would have said. Yeah, but can we can we seriously talk about it? Like what if it turns out like they do first contact, they go down, and it turns out that like Luaxana is par for the course for beta zoid females, and like if somebody attaches them like Pike interacts with one of these people, like that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. That would be amazing. Pike would not, not Pike Pike would not recover, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, well, how long do beta Zs live? Is Loxana? Well, it would not alive? be Loxana, obviously, but I mean we would guess 120 years or so. It's you know, extended. They One storyline that I forgot to mention was the storyline between Sam slash George and yeah. James. And her. Yeah. yeah. So, hate is gonna hate. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, Sam is one of those characters that we only got a brief mention of, right, in the original series in Operation Annihilate. Um, and we don't see him. He's And his wife are dead. That's it. Mm, and then, yeah. you know, he has a, like, they have a son who gets taken on by Kirk, and then we never hear about him again. Yeah, um, yeah you're going to live with me now. Never see him again. Right. Like, <laughs> are you going to put him in your closet? Because, like, bro, you do not have much of a closet. Um, oh, I know. I know. Um, but. I didn't even know that I was would, on there. I would really, I <laughs> honestly would really, really like to see more development of Sam. And, you know, but I kind of get it, right? I kind of get what they were going for here but i don't think there was quite enough groundwork laid for it i feel like that there there it's funny because they're it's like brother tension and but one of the brothers is like in this fight and the other one's like what are you talking about dude i'm just living right. my life like like <laughs> sam is like in conflict with you know no in competition with uh with jim but jim's just in competition with himself he's not even thinking about trying to win anything but himself and Starfleet. I, you know, I think that, is, I'm sorry, Jermaine, you go. Except that um, he kind of looks down on his brother's profession, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I thought was nice. I, th I thought that was really, really nice because um, what it does is it, 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 it sets up a dynamic between the two of them that might be inescapable and gives us more tension between the two of them. Yes, they're brothers, yes, they love each other, but that tension between the two of them is there. And you know, you know, there's tension between me and my sister. I love her to death. <laughs> but there's tension. Right. Oh yeah, no. Like there's and, there's and constant real. yeah, no, I have a brother and they're they're constant dick measuring contests, despite the fact that I don't have the anatomy to do that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm laughing. It, mostly because I just broke broke Keith. My bad. But uh, <laughs> oh, you broke Keith, huh? Well, Sam needs to be worried about. Uh, Sam needs to be worried yeah, about staying I mean, away from flying jellyfish, and it'll be okay. 
I feel like that's always good advice. <laughs> um, and there's, a, sci- and there's, a, sci- there's a sci-fi movie um, about flying jellyfish in the offing, I'm sure. It's going to go li- it's going to be jellyfish NATO. What's the oh my god. Arrival? <laughs> good call. The arrival um, is a good movie. Yeah, it's great. But yeah, like a- another interesting uh, dissection of what is communication and how to see things from a different way. Right. Except that more is messing with time. And- I've but I've always felt with Arrival that those aliens would have been smart enough to can make communicate with us better than us having to figure out what they're saying. You know what I'm saying? But whatever. Actually, that's one of the things I really love about this episode, um, because there's this whole conversation about, you know, what I, the, the concept, right, of language and the concept of, of linguistic similarity is interesting. But when you think about it, there shouldn't be a whole lot of commonality between different species. They're growing up on a different planet. They have a different anatomy. They have like different cultures. So language is messy and language is hard and there's not as much, I mean, there's a lot of commonality, but there's not a lot as much commonality as we think. Um, And so like, and so Uhura sort of experiencing, uh, experiencing communication that doesn't make sense, I think is perfect. I think it's great. And I think it's what would happen. I don't know that we would, I, we would recognize communication if we saw it necessarily because their communication may look, radically different than what we think it should it may look I, I still think there are there is a basis for certain things that like there are like we have nouns there are things and there are actions and there are descriptions of things so when behind well, that actually there, let's there talk about emotion. that for a second let's but, talk about that for except except for a second um because not every language has those um I think every language has those. They don't have the Mm-mm. little things in between, like the pronouns and the. Nope, 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 nope. Not every language does. So, for example, um, you have, I mean, in Eastern languages, you may or may not have the same concept of what an action is that we have. And also, like, if you look at tense structures in American English versus, say, British English, it's very different. Well, I'm not talking about tense structures. I'm not talking about the actual. No, I know, but I'm you're talking, talking about, about like a basic, like a basic concept, a basic concept of an action. Yes. Um, but what I'm going to say is, is it's not always the same thing, right? It's not always going to be the same concept. Um, for example, Japanese leaves a lot out when well, because... you're constructing a sentence, right? Like, what I mean, what can mean, um, I understand, understand. you understand, um, they understand, um, understanding occur, like uh, understanding is an unfinished action in the past, it's an unfinished action in the future. Um, it's a I wide it's like, range of things. I think things. it's more like um, understanding the emotion behind the word because of why, of why someone is doing it. Like if you take the, if you take the verb of running, right? Someone's running, but someone's also always also fleeing, or chasing, or racing, or all and those things. It may as be someone's money, that someone's, different languages call the action the same thing and don't differentiate, right. and that bring raises the question: Do we have? I mean, does that language then have a concept of what these are? Um, and what Ahura is wrestling, wrestling with is individuals who don't have concepts of language the way we do and don't have concepts of how to communicate. And so what they do, and, th- and this is a little bit about like, you know, you, you mentioned night terrors, right? Um, yeah. And there's a lot that's really goofy about night terrors. Okay. Like let's, let's put that out there. But one of the things that's really great is you have to distill it to its simplest most digestible element in order to get your me- your message across. And that's that's mm-hmm. the whole point of Lost in Translation, right? Um, as a title, right? Because there's certain things that we lose by not, uh, by not having that same sort of communication. Um, I remember 
like a million years ago, we're not going to talk about how many, but a million years ago when I was sitting in a French class and I was reading L'Etranger in French, which is Camus the Stranger. What's interesting about that novel is it's entirely written in the present tense. There is no past, there is no future. It's entirely written in the present tense. The problem is- Like a screenplay. Mm, but the problem is, is that doesn't translate well because the way um, French translates, like verbal French translates a past tense is what we, is to use a present participle for the verb to have, which indicates that there's always a, a sense of present impact of a past action, which is not something that we have in English. Like, for example, take your, um, take your, uh, take your running, take running, right? J'ai couru. Like, I ran is how I would translate that. But that's not actually what's happening linguistically. It's, I have run, which is still a present context. Well, just look well, like, like, what, like what I was saying, like when you write screenplays, they're always written in present tense. As it right. to and novels, that's, and that's, they're always written in, well, you, I don't want to say always, usually written in past tense. You know, well, you, like you're depends. telling us, novels are usually, you're telling a story of something that has happened. Or the screenplay is something that you're showing what is happening because it's happening now on the screen. Right. But I mean, but how do you translate that? How do you sit down and, and create like the narrative in The Stranger um, it, and put it in an English context? Because in English, you can say, I have done, I have blah, I have the, but it means something different to an English speaker than it does to a French speaker. Shaka when the walls fell. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is a okay. I love Darmok. All right, it's a ridiculous concept. In no way would this actually work in real life, but it's such a great metaphor for communication. But, but if you think about it, so let's let's take that Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra, right? This is present tense. This is you and me right now. We are Darmok and Jalad at. at Jalad at Tanagra. It's not telling the story. Remember when John Don Mark and Jalad went to Mark at, at Tanagra? It's saying, hey, this is you and me. We're doing this right now. Present tense. Yeah. Um, but I'm also not trying to communicate a past action to you in that. True, but Don Mark and Jalad are a past action. Something that is, it, it has a past yeah, action except, except, the, present except the metaphor is, I mean, there's not really, but it, that's a great example of a language that doesn't have tenses. Right. Right. You, you know, this is becoming a linguistics course. And you, uh, and, and, and Jermaine's like, please major. stop. <laughs> but, not my major. <laughs> but that's what this episode is all about is the lost in translation. And it's not just Ahura not being able to understand, but the miscommunication between Una and Pelia, the miscommunication yes. between Sam and Jim. The miscommunication yes. between Chapel and Spock. Everybody is miscommunicating in this episode in some because way. Because they're talking, they're talking about the same thing, but they're not really reaching it. Yeah. But um, it made sense that they picked Uhura because she's like, "Well, why me?" It's just like, "This is your they, bag, lady." It went to your brain, and they saw that you were the one that could do it. Which I think, uh, like I always said, this Enterprise when they introduced. Hoshi, what her job is, it was like the best thing that happened to Star Trek. It was like, look, yeah, the communications officer should know how to communicate. Uhura in the original series, what was that, Star Trek 2 or 3, when she was like reading this Klingon book horribly? Uh, Star Trek 6, The Undiscovered Country. Yeah. It was like, in, in it was like, come that on. Michelle Nichols absolutely hated and felt should not have been included. Yeah. She should have been able to just run that script, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but, the, the um, idea that she wouldn't know how to speak a dialect of Klingon. Right. I gotta say, I think Nichelle would be really excited to see what they're letting Sealy Rose Gooding do. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. really oh, so much more than so much more than she got to do. How about have a backstory for one? <laughs> how about a first name? <laughs> yes. Yeah, first. Another thing, yeah, she didn't get a first name until two thousand nine. So, <laughs> right. Well, what I love though was I love the power of memories that we were able to see in this particular episode and how memories themselves, memories that a person creates, even though it, it never actually happened, she created a memory 
Um, and it became something that these aliens made her experience. Um, and I, I, I loved that because there was pain attached to it, but there was meaning also attached in terms of what the the aliens were trying to get her to understand. And so I loved what they were able to do in, in this particular episode as it relates to memories. I think that goes to uh, sort of what Jason was talking about. It um, does, but it wasn't conversation. expressed. Right. Like the whole conversation, like the looking at the special. emotional reality, because <laughs> when you don't have the words to communicate, what's, what is your commonality? And the commonality is we all feel, right? We mm -hmm. all experience we all grief. We all experience love. We all experience anger and frustration and all of these things. And so they used those as a method to communicate. But also it's a great meditation on grief and how it impacts us. Because one of the things that Uhura talks about is like she allowed her grief and her pain to take away even the good memories. I mean, that goes to say, like, when you talk about Troy, I always wonder was she ever useful? Because all she ever said was she, she did often let them know, like, <laughs> they're afraid. They're confused. If they're, you get us you know, blackballed by Marina Sirtis. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Marina. <laughs> Not that I don't like her, but we like, think her Troy is useful. I, on the she surface, was an impact, so it was all about news. Emotion, on the surface, right? I really like her, but if you go through and, and watch the episodes and how many times they asked for something, she was just like, it could be either way. Like, no, I mean, it's not really, really until second. I mean, and I think she'd be the first to acknowledge that it's not really until seasons like six and seven that they actually give her things to do mm -hmm. and let her be significant and not just like a victim of things. Um, um I, I guess my distinction, I guess my whole point was that what she did always try to relay is what the emotions of the people were. So that was like, that would be like the basis of what the communication is. Mm -hmm. Another um, point uh, that happened in this particular episode was <laughs> Ahura was in the middle of her hallucin hallucination and she does this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hit me. <laughs> also, like, can we say how much I Which love that she this? got to smack him? Like, um, yeah. Yeah. And he was hitting on her. I mean, come on. <laughs> I know, I know. That's and just like, how he talks. That's just how he talks. Well, no, no, because after that, he stuck. There's a difference in how he talks to her after he. she hit. After she blatantly tells him no and then leaves because she is not having any of it. Oh, the look on her face there is fantastic. Yeah, but is no, it no. is it that just his character? He's just a charismatic man, and that's just how he talks. Yeah, but that was, the point was is there was no charisma. Like that was not what was going on. Um. I have been in that situation. I have been sitting at the bar and been like, he's like, you sit next to me. And I'm like, no, bitch. I sat in an empty seat and wanted a drink. Mm. This does not mean that I want to talk to you. Touche. Mm -hmm. And she was very much giving off the, I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm having a real rough day kind of vibe. Now, I'm grateful as far as the story goes that um, he was willing to pursue that um but it's a little creepy that he followed her from the bar yeah or was he just leaving no he was following her no i'm just saying like <laughs> or was he just leaving well maybe he saw someone someone in distress and just felt like you know what <laughs> by the way how is nobody in the hallway another good question right yeah Usually there's just random people walking around. I mean, Actually, on, on Strange New Worlds, there's usually not a lot of random people walking around in the, in the hallways. That, that, I mean, they've got to use their budget judiciously, guys. I mean, they have that giant AR wall. That could be remnants of COVID, too. You know, they're mm -hmm. still under some of the restrictions when they were filming, so they couldn't have as many extras in certain scenes. Yeah. TNG and like uh, Voyager always had random people in the background walking. Yeah, sometimes the people in regular 1990s clothing, too. So. In fact. <laughs> But yeah, like, it, but but I do have real questions about like why, why he was there. Yeah, no one else when the Farragut came over, and then after he had his drinks with Sam, he stuck around. He didn't go back to the Farragut. 
until I'm like, do you not have things to do? Or maybe he went over to see his brother, you know? What? Yeah, but his brother very much did not want to see him. So, like, is he just tooling <laughs> around the Enterprise looking to pick up some tail? Like, I mean... I mean... Yeah, his brother ditched him, but why is he still there? <laughs> and I want to go back to that for a second, because I think you're... I, I, I think... <laughs> I think I think you pointed this out, Keith, um, about how just fundamentally disinterested he is in his brother's life. Like he doesn't even pretend to care. Yeah. Well, and I, that's and that's crappy. Yeah. Well, just the fact that Sam became the bigger man that came up to him and said that the Farragut is lucky to have you. The, the reaction to that should be Jim saying, and the Enterprise is lucky to have you. But no. no it's, because I think Sam, it would have been like, really nice. The, uh, hmm? Go ahead, Marie. Go ahead, Marie. No, no, no. I, I think it would have been really nice if they saved Kirk and Spock meeting for the, like the last episode of the show. Yeah, that was a little weirdly shoehorned in. I'm not going to lie. Well, what's funny is with Spock coming in to clean up after Sam's mess again. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know they already mentioned that. I'm like, get back around. <laughs> the one thing that I've noticed, um, especially this particular season, a little bit in the first season, but especially in this particular season, they use Spock a lot for some type of emotional resonance um, mm -hmm. for us. And I'm getting a little tired of it. I don't know about you. I'm not going to comment. He's the most developed character. <laughs> I mean, we know Jason hates him. So <laughs> Jason does not hate Spock. I don't hate them. I hate what they what they're toying toying with what the character should be and what we you know they're just like teetering him on this emotional. I don't know. They, they did that in the original they series too, though. Yes. But they did it so much less and so much better. Less is more in the, in the next case. Oh no! No, you know it was more subtle. It was like. It was like Bones would say something. <laughs> it, it was like Bones would say something, and and then his eyebrow would raise. You know, it was very like it's very. It was very moments here and there. And that whole scene. Uh, you know, that is something that is missing in this particular episode. Not episode, but in 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 this series, there's no bones to Spock. There's no right. one who's going to challenge him in a funny way. You and know I was what? Hoping that's, that's what Paleo would be. That I, I think that's why they are. I think that's why they're writing it into the script for him to, to for him to bring it out for all these other reasons. When, uh, basically, Bones was the one to bring it out every once in a while. That was like his purpose when it came to Spock, literally. So now we don't have him there. We don't have that balance between them. We don't have that struggle between those two people. And so now it's just coming out in these other ways. It's just kind of like, it feels a little forced. I think you hit the nail on the head, Jermaine. Yeah. I, I just want to see more of her. <laughs> and I didn't I mean, think they, yeah, they did her character who, justice. Wait, her, more who? Chapel? No, Paley. Hell yeah. Oh, Paley. Like oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, I mean, the way that she's not backing down from Una Chin Riley, um, the way that she sees directly through what's actually going on. Um, and I gotta say, I really loved the acknowledgement that it's not super easy to move on from the loss of Hammer. That was really nice because we don't typically don't, see that. No, we don't. Uh, and there will be a, a couple of implications, but like this was such a centered part of the narrative of you know Hemmer being missing, and and it's it's obviously hard for Uhura to interact with Pelia for the same reason, and there's a reason that we have that sequence with Hemmer, like Uhura watching the Hemmer video juxtaposed with Pelia, so because that's the lead in to Unich and Riley and that conflict. Which is really great storytelling and really great mm -hmm. um, plot balancing. Um, so, but I would really like to see more of Pelia, right? Like, I like, <laughs> I want to find out more about the Lanthanites. We, we need a Pelia, and not and not necessarily just a comical way, because it seems like she's all most of her scenes are kind of made to be a little comical. Except in this particular episode. Well, it wasn't there. 
I was there. Hey, there was. I mean, there was some. There was some hilarity. Like with there respect are to crumbs the on your uniform. When did you eat? <laughs> right. But that wasn't Bailey. That was Una, which was good for her. That yeah. was I know, right? Her. I know that was fantastic. But also, the whole conversation was like, "The C, you deserved that C." And then they, it turns on a dime into something far more real. Like, and that's something that this season has done really well. By the way. Like, for example, Charades is an episode that should have just been about weird Vulcan hijinks, and that's not what they do. Do but as a teacher, um, do you remember what you grade you gave somebody five years ago? Yes. I don't. Like, and, and do you it's, remember it's every paper you read? Between, it's it's different. I'm assuming it's different between Marie and myself. I teach 106. I taught 167 mm -hmm. students, and I'm grading every single day. So right, no, and I mine is very different, right. right? Because like I'm grading, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, depending on what it is. It's a longer assignment, but like, and I have fewer students. I mean, I thought it was weird that she'd be like, "Oh, it was sloppy and all this." And I was like, "You really remember that person's paper?" Hey, and it hey, wasn't hey, a great paper. <laughs> if it was a great paper, like a phenomenal paper, I understand that. But yeah. just like a mediocre right. paper. Let's have a conversation about this because I, I love that you brought this up. I guarantee you that Una Chin Riley showed up and was memorable in class because I guarantee you she was that obnoxious student that was going to try to catch you and being wrong and who had to be right at every single fucking time. Um, sorry, I've had one or two of those. Plus, I oh, was, plus and it's funny because I was that kid. Plus, if, I if, was if, that if, kid, so I want were, I want to apologize right now to all of my teachers for being that obnoxious. Yeah, I was that obnoxious too. Yeah, if and I remember child, those. There was, uh, if you had a student that all of a sudden was your the first officer of the ship that you serve on, you probably would go back and look her up. Could be. Could look be. up what she, what she did. I think I would in, remember, in your class. Like, I think I would have remembered Una Chin Riley, and I think I, I mean, I remember I remember both the very great students and the very crappy students. Not a right. lot in the middle. Not in the middle, right? Yeah. Be remembered one way or the other. Don't be yeah, mediocre. I, think, I, think I don't know. Jermaine, remembered. you may not remember any of them, but that's generally. <laughs> I remember faces. I mean, like, I forget these names. kids. <laughs> I think yeah, I might... don't remember names either. I, I remember papers, though, <laughs> which is which is bizarre. And I get the vibe of Pelia that she remembers Una for that paper and other things, but she remember, remembers Hemmer just as being there. I, I doubt that she would remember what grade she gave Hemmer. I got a question about how you feel about the progression. Because this is actually the first Star Trek that we have had that doesn't have a character focus. Like, for example... You mean a main character? Like a main character focus. Okay. That's what I mean. Not, not like it doesn't focus on any characters. It doesn't have like, have like TNG was... Kirk, Spock, and uh, whatever the guy, Doctor Guy, yeah. um, <laughs> the Doctor Guy, Doctor Guy. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, it's not. Well, it's one of the first ones that isn't centered on the captain. You know, Discovery was like the first one that isn't centered on the captain. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly had its favorites of who was going to, who the main characters were going to be on the show, like every week. Um, but this one doesn't have a focus on the captain. Which is weird because we got the show because everybody liked Pike on Discovery. So we're like, let's give, let's make a Pike show. Uh, oh, I don't like. So I'm just wondering how you guys trio. feel about it that. The, it was the trio. It wasn't just Pike, but I mean, Pike obviously was the one we got the most of. But we seen the fandom responded to all three of them, Spock and Una as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just but wondering. I think, but I think Jermaine actually has. I made this point several episodes ago where that Strange New Worlds is really great at balancing the ensemble cast right. in a way that we haven't seen in a while. I will say this, though. I was disappointed with how they handled Una's character at the very beginning of this particular season. Yes, there was an episode that was about her, but was it really about her? And what I mean by that was that the action was about her, but we didn't see a lot of her in terms of her dialogue. And I had I had a problem with that. And I still have a problem with her particular character all throughout this particular season. I feel like her character is just 
a background character. I I feel like that too. I, I often compare her to Riker and what we get from Riker as a strong character in the show. And like you said, we got an entire episode about her, but it really wasn't about her. It was just like about this idea of should this person be prosecuted or not? It wasn't, we didn't really get much of her as far as character and who she is. So I, I do feel like we're, we're lacking as a number one, as a first officer. But one reason why we are lacking as a first officer because we're also lacking in a captain in this ep- in this season because we're getting so much of other characters. We're not getting a lot of Pike at all. I kind of so respectfully disagree though. Man. I mean, you knew this was coming, y'all. Like, you knew. <laughs> but I do. I respectfully disagree because I think we've gotten some really concise, tight characterization of Una. She has that amazing speech. Maybe today. Um, we got more from her today than we kind of no, have. No, ama- she has that amazing speech when she describes what it was like to grow up on a colony and when she and her parents were making decisions. Um, we get. We also get that great sort of characterization that we see today and it's it's concise um it's kind of like to bring last episode where to bring does in like three sentences just kind of destroy spock um but it tells us so much about to bring and what she's looking for and why she's frustrated but we don't get i i don't feel like we get a captain first officer relationship much i mean i see we see a lot of walk and talks with them you know, but not, um, in situa- not in like situations, not in dangerous situations. Like they're not, they're not a team together handling the problem. You know what I mean? I mean, even Chakotay and Janeway were always like kind of a team handling the problem. Well, they had difficulties figuring out how to work out Chakotay. I mean, yeah, right. It took it took them probably two seasons to figure that out. I don't even. I think it took them. It was fast. I think it was no second. First episode, he was he was supporting her, even though it was like conflict between the Maquis and whatever. He was still supporting J Way from from, mm-hmm. from the jump, right after Caretaker. I mean, you could say they went the whole seven seasons without not ever really figuring out what kind of character Chicote was. Like, they never really developed him. He well supported, but he supported Janeway all the time, except for like three episodes mm-hmm. of the entire show. I do want to say this though, because <clears throat> I felt the ex- the exact same way that Jason and, and Keith felt. However, this is this is what I felt at that particular moment in time in history. It was important for us to see the woman step forward mm-hmm. and the man support. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I guess so. At that time. <laughs> I don't necessarily know that it's just at that time either. <laughs> I'm just saying like it, that that was a statement that Star Trek was making at that mm-hmm. time. Yes. Yes, for all the folks who said Star Trek was hasn't been woke. Yeah. <laughs> I will show one thing about this episode that I found interesting was for being ostensibly in a horror episode, it took every basically everyone got checked in on in some way and they Every storyline we've had this season got moved forward some way. I mean, right. the, the brief scene of Spock and Chapel, the brief discussion of the fact that this nebula is near Gorn space, which, you know, mm-hmm. keep on calling back the Gorn threat that mm-hmm. they've been hinting at since the first episode. And so every, every storyline we've been dealing with gets that gradual step forward while also still having your story of the week you guys said that this season was going to be about the Gorn. You said that. I did. Piece. I did too. Did they not just reference the Gorn in today? They, they referenced it. But, <laughs> but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Five episodes in. Six. How many? How, how many are we six in? Six episodes in. Six. There are only and, four episodes left. But and we they do just know there will be reference. Gorn appearing at some point. But, and there's no real long arc, is there, for this? Yeah, there is. Do you feel like there is oh, yeah. for this season? I don't think it's, I mean, besides, it's besides kind of on the back burner besides. because we've been focused on sort of like slice of life, day in the life kind of stories, but it's very Spoiler. much floating around back there. Like we care about this particular gas station because it's near Gorn space. And in the event that we need to take on the Gorn, we're uh-huh. going to need deuterium, I guess. I guarantee the Gorn aren't going to care about killing those little 
deuterium flies? No. But then again, we don't know that the Gorn used deuterium. We don't know much about the know. Gorn, we except that they're yeah. like aliens from Alien. They swing really slow. Oh, that was just that one Gorn he was talking about. <laughs> it was a <laughs> city. As it turns out, as it turns out, Kirk was fighting a geriatric <laughs> Gorn. <laughs> That was his last wish before he died. Oh my god. That Gorn had a right <laughs> He got right, knocked guys, like, Hold up, hold up. Hour mark. <laughs> the hour mark. Do we have any final thoughts? Uh, well, I do find it interesting that uh, Syrian brandy is medicinal in the original series, but oh, it's at the bar here now. And it's a different color oh, now. I didn't notice yeah. that. It's a different color. Well, we just blame that on different cameras. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> we all I, make I excuses. That. Like, we I'm all like, make oh. excuses. And blame it's it okay. on frame rate. Blame it on the frame rates. <laughs> <laughs> These different frame rates back then. All right. So next week we will be doing um, the crossover episode, the much anticipated Lower Decks crossover episode. And if you are attending San Diego Comic Con, you will get to watch the episode a couple of days early. Because they got nothing else to show at San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> right. Because ninety percent of the studios are not showing up. Right. And also bear in mind, do not cancel your streaming services quite yet. That has not been called for. Yeah. yeah. But stand with the actors, stand with the writers. They're not getting their fair share. But Hollywood CEOs are holding too much back. Wouldn't that would 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 canceling your services not be standing with them? They, they have asked that you not cancel the services because they they would see it as evidence. They felt that CEOs would see it as evidence of the, the streaming service need to use less writers and less actors. They could do more AI, do more right. with less. The point is, is like if you're watching the streaming services, there's value there. And that value is derived from the labor of the actors and the writers. Right, if, they're not work, if they're not working, then I figured standing behind them would be boycotting it. It. But, but they have asked that you not. There was a letter okay. going around explaining the economics of it and how you the, you don't want the ho the Hollywood executives blaming the writers for when they end up canceling half of the stuff on streaming, and mm -hmm. they they'll point to look at how many subscribers we lost because of right. you, mm -hmm. right? And well, that's, that's not point. what we want to do. So all right, that's so right. same okay. bat time, same bat channel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Get your prodigy toys and let them know that you <laughs> support Star Trek Prodigy and should be picked up. Right? Prodigy love. 28,931 right. signatures. And are, aren't they up for an Emmy? Yes, they were nominated for mm -hmm. an Emmy. Uh, Card was nominated for two Emmys as well. And I believe there was one other. I'm not sure. Yeah. So yeah, go, go buy right. your... Go buy your Prodigy merch, show our support, and we will see you next week. See ya. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I'm not going to ever say it on the internet. Yeah, never. <laughs> yeah. I, I, oh, I, my I, God. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, wait, wait, wait. There was a shadow of a church. Okay. What? William has questionable oh, ideas about what he puts. William has that questionable way. ideas about what he puts on the internet. <laughs> oh, I remember that episode. Uh -huh. I remember that episode, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> 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 Wait, what? Wait. Wait. <laughs> 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 <laughs>